Hello. This audiovisual presentation is brought to you by Morbida Cigarettes. The discerning choice of cigarette between the 12 to 16 age bracket. Mums, if you're going to be picking up some cigarettes during your weekly shop for little Timmy this week, make sure it's Morbida. Now that the hype machine seems to be slowly gaining momentum for the PS5 and whatever stupid name Microsoft decide to call their latest offering, the Xbox 2, I find myself groaning at the thought of yet another console I own becoming obsolete. In the past though, planned obsolescence of an old system wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but over the course of the two most recent console generations, the 7th and 8th, I feel that things just haven't advanced enough to justify a 9th. Let me explain further. When I was a wee lad, there were only really two main reasons for wanting to upgrade to a newer or different video game console or home computer. The first was normally because newer consoles and computers had better graphics and sound, a vital component in trying to replicate something at home that felt closer to the endorphin pumping audiovisual goodness of what you experienced in the arcade. The second reason was because newer systems would often release with exclusive games that you couldn't experience on older systems or rival consoles. So if you wanted to experience Daytona USA at home, the only way it was going to happen was if you traded up from your Sega Mega Drive to a Sega Saturn. But if you were more of a Ridge Racer kind of guy, the only way that was going to happen is if you bought a PlayStation. In the past, I have twice bought an entire console for one game only. The original Xbox for Outrun 2, and the Xbox 360 for Hydro Thunder Hurricane. I hasten to add here, in both instances, this was quite late in both consoles' life cycles, so I got them for greatly reduced prices compared to when they first came out. And for me, the promise of better graphics and awesome exclusive games has been enough of a motivating force in the past to keep me upgrading. The jump in the audiovisual quality of the games going from 8 to 16-bit in itself alone was astounding, from my ZX Spectrum, Sega Master System, and Sega Mega Drive before you even think about the 32-bit systems. With the advent of the Sega Saturn and the PS1, home consoles were now capable of producing 2D games that looked just as good as the ones you'd find in the arcade. But this wasn't all. The PS1 and Saturn also heralded games move away from 2D to 3D polygon graphics, with both machines being capable of 3D graphics in their games that the old 16-bit consoles just couldn't compete with. The PS1 was where I finally jumped from the good ship Sega into the unknown waters of Sony and fell in love with games like Metal Gear Solid, Ridge Racer Type 4, Wipeout 2097 and Resident Evil 2. Games that just would not have been possible on the old 16-bit machines, taking advantage of new hardware innovations such as CD-ROMs that could store far more data than cartridges, allowing for games that were far bigger in scope than anything that had gone before them. Then the next generation came along and blew the old 32-bit consoles out of the water, with the Sega Dreamcast, as I've mentioned in another video, able to create amazing 3D graphics that looked as good as its arcade contemporaries. Sadly though, the Dreamcast reign was short-lived, and after its premature death, I moved sideways, technologically speaking, onto the PS2, lured by the manly charms of Solid Snake after playing a demo of Metal Gear Solid 2 at a friend's house. After this, the original Xbox and Outrun 2 and Panzer Dragoon Auto persuaded me to sell my PS2, and the quick dip into Nintendo territory in the GameCube after this. Being a massive Star Wars fan back then, the game that swung me in the direction of the GameCube was Rogue Squadron, which frankly looked amazing, and that at the time yet to be released, but looking equally amazing in magazine stills, F-Zero GX. So back then, I was quite happy to not only upgrade to a next generation console, but also to take a sideways step to a contemporaneous one, if that system had a couple of exclusive games I really wanted to play. But after this, it actually took me quite a long time before I got on board with the seventh generation of consoles. Sure, I really wanted to give Metal Gear Solid 4 a try, but there just didn't seem to be that many games on either Xbox 360 or PS3 I was that desperate to play. 
had gaming apathy kicked in now that I was getting older? It wasn't until I played Wipeout HD Fury on my mate Andy's PS3 on his big HD TV for the first time that the war factor really kicked in, and the jump in just how much more advanced the graphics were between the 7th and 6th generation of consoles really hit home. I'd finally found both the game and the reason to buy a PS3. And as a non-PC gamer back then, I really thought graphics and games had reached their zenith with the PS3, with stuff like the aforementioned Wipeout HD, and other games like Ridge Racer 7 and the Arkham, Bioshock and Call of Duty games just absolutely blowing me away with how amazing they looked, particularly as this was my first time experiencing games in HD. Sega and Namco even got in on the action with some excellent ports of some of their arcade titles. Then the PS4 and Xbox One were announced, and the apathy returned. When the PS4 and Xbox One were announced, I initially had zero interest in either. Why would I want to spend £350 on a system offering the same old tired franchises, with games that barely looked any different to the ones I was currently playing? The only two next-gen games I really wanted to try out were Star Wars Battlefront and Arkham Knight, and it turned out with a simple video card upgrade I could meet the minimum specs to play both on my PC. Other than the two games I just mentioned, there were no first-party or exclusive titles on either console I really gave two shits about. In fact, it's only just been slightly over a year and a half since I bit the bullet and bought a second-hand PlayStation 4. Again, this was after playing Wipeout Omega Collection on my mate Andy's new PS4. A game I was on the fence about initially, as I'd already got HD Fury, but was curious about all the Wipeout 2048 content. So once again, Wipeout turned out to be the PlayStation killer app for me. Now the thing with all the consoles I've mentioned previously, is that each generation represented a massive quantum leap in both the quality of the graphics and to a lesser extent in later generations sound. Compared to what came before them, innovations in technology allowed for games to grow in size, as the move from cassettes to discs to cartridges to CDs, DVDs and Blu-rays allowed games to expand from a few kilobytes to gigabytes. So with each progressive generation, games have not only got better looking, they've also got bigger and more complex, but the progression from 7th to 8th generation just doesn't feel like it's brought anything new to the mix, and it feels like stagnation has set in. Of the three main hardware developers left in the market, at least Nintendo has tried to do something innovative with their new systems each time, with admittedly varying degrees of success. But surely what these 8th generation consoles lack in innovation, they may cut for with vastly improved graphics over the PS3 and Xbox 360, right? The thing is though, as amazingly purdy as Wipeout Omega Collection looks, and it does look bloody amazing, in truth, it only really looked a little bit more sparkly and polished than Wipeout HD did on the good old PS3. I read online a while ago that the PS4 is 10 times more powerful than the PS3, but in all honesty, I really can't see that much difference between the two. Not like the difference in going back to playing a PS1 game after using the Dreamcast, or an original Xbox title after the PS3, or even the humble Sega Master System compared to the Mega Drive. Worse still, there are some games that actually seem to have taken a step backwards. I downloaded a demo of the rally game Gravel not that long ago, on this 8th generation console that's supposedly 10 times more powerful than the PS3. The best the game developers could come up with was a racing game that ran at 30 frames a second. Are you shitting my balls? There were PS3 games that came out years ago that ran at 60 frames per second and still looked amazing. Like Ridge Racer 7 here, a first generation PS3 title that was released in 2006 and managed to look this good in HD, all whilst maintaining a 60 frames per second refresh rate. So are you seriously telling me that in this day and age it's still acceptable for a developer to churn out a racing title on a console that's allegedly 10 times more powerful than the ones that came before it, and the game still only runs at 30 frames a second? Like I said earlier in the video, I think graphics peaked with the PS3 and Xbox 360, Yes, the PS4 and Xbox One have got better looking games, but to my eye at any rate, the difference between the two is minimal, so why on earth would I want to fork out hundreds of pounds on a future system that'll also probably only look a tiny bit better than what we're experiencing at the moment, with the same old tired franchises coming out on it? And it's not just the hassle of having to pay out for a new system, it's all the extras that go with it. New joypads that cost 50 quid a shot, 
new mini USB cables because fucking Sony won't let you reuse your old ones from the previous gen, the added hassle of finding additional space under the TV for yet another new console, with your TV's original two paltry HD inputs seeming woefully inadequate now, but you ain't a shit you need to plug into them. And yes, I've been ruthless in the past when it comes to selling old systems, but you know what? There are actually still quite a lot of games I like to go back and play on my PS3, original Xbox, Dreamcast and 360. And the newer systems now have some of these games inexorably linked to them, with DLC and digital downloads stored on their hard drives that is now no longer available to purchase. The issue of downloadable content and the direction the gaming industry is going in is also a cause for concern, with unscrupulous practices like on-disc DLC, microtransactions, DLC that really should have been part of the main game but has been intentionally left out to grab a quick buck, and the whole games as a service model and season passes that cost more than the game itself. Not to mention the games that now seem to regard single player content as an afterthought, that's if it's even included at all, with their main focus being only on online play. These are all issues that make me think that once my PS4 has gone the way of the dodo, I'll be done with the current generation of gaming. Now forgive me for sounding like a grumpy old git, but I miss the days when you used to just come home from the computer shop with a cartridge or CD-ROM, slap it into your console or home computer and it worked and that was it. You didn't have to rely on a day one 20 gigabyte update for your game to fix all the game breaking bugs the developers didn't have time to fix because the shareholders of twatting Activision and EA haven't left them enough time to fix everything before the release date. I also miss the days when enjoying a game didn't involve me having to play it online against a bunch of 12 year olds with ninja reflexes who just mercilessly kill me over and over and fucking over again. So yeah, we've got all that shit to look forward to next generation too. Mm. We're veering dangerously close back into gaming apathy territory here. Whereas each of the older generations of consoles all felt like a big step up from the previous ones, in terms of both how good the games looked and what they were capable of doing, that need to upgrade just isn't there for me with the 8th going into the 9th. Games have peaked visually, so I feel that any further graphical advancements will just be superfluous to the gaming experience I'm currently enjoying at home. So the announcement of new consoles on the horizon seems less about innovation and more just an arbitrary date that Sony and Microsoft have decided that the technology I'm currently using is going to become obsolete. The PS4 released six years ago in 2013, and the internet tells me that the life cycle of a console is roughly five years. But the thing is, current gen games still look amazing, particularly when you start throwing things like VR into the mix as well, one of the things that I do think has been a true innovation of this generation. Yes, I think the difference graphically between this gen and last is absolutely minimal, but that's because I think the last generation looked amazing as well. Play some Bioshock Infinite on PS3, and tell me that it isn't a jaw-droppingly gorgeous game. I don't care about photorealistic graphics or games that run at 320 frames per second. I just want games that look as good as they can on this current generation of hardware. And yes, that does mean I want 60 frames per second as a minimum on my PS4. Sure, the PS4, Xbox One and PC versions of Bioshock Infinite are better looking, but as it is, does this really look like a game that needed to be graphically superseded? Trying to achieve that goal of continually improved graphics feels like a Sisyphean task to me, rolling that boulder uphill for eternity. You're always going to get people who want these improvements, but traditionally, these have tended to be the gamers who populate the PC gaming scene, a scene where people can upgrade parts of their hardware to get improved performance without the need for an entirely new system. For those of us that are quite content with the performance of our current consoles, can't we just, you know, leave them to it and keep things as they are? Now I know I'm pissing in the wind here and that these industry changes will happen no matter how much I moan about it, but for the time being at least, can't we just be happy with what we've got? It is I, Starscream, your new ruler. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Because if you don't, I'll know about it. And then you'll be truly sorry.